Hello, I'm Libby Hepburn, a founding member of AXA and working in citizen science for 20 years. You may know me from a number of working groups in Australia, but today I'm speaking as co-chair of the recently formed Global Community of Practice on Citizen Science and Open Science. I've been invited to talk to you about how we establish this community of practice and how we work with co-creation to deliver meaningful results together. Results together. You're interested in how to enrich connections and partnerships in your work and how to manage a, a successful community of practice. So we will be hearing both from UNESCO and we observe about the importance of principles and values as the basis for the way we structure our work. Fundamental to citizen science is its ambition to benefit both science and society. And the process of the community of practice is a direct response to the need to work in new ways if we are to make any difference to the wicked problems that the world faces today. Key principles and values are shared across the citizen science and open science community. And now over the last decade, they're also being recognized as crucial by the big global agencies for change. For instance, the 2030 Agenda and the SDGs. This is a, a reason why um, these agencies are now seeing citizen science and open science as potentially important partners in achieving change in both policy and action. Today we'll look at this community of practice as an example. UNESCO people have been involved in a number of our working groups and communities of practice and in July they reached out to several of us to invite us to, to contribute to a global perspective on the relationship between citizen science and open science to help in developing their recommendation in 2021. Here is Anna Persik, who's working with us from UNESCO, talking at, at the recent EXA conference as part of our community of practice and my name is Anna Persic. I work here at UNESCO in Paris. I'm the chief of section for uh, science policy and partnerships in the division of science policy, uh, and science policy and capacity building. And because we see open science as something that is very much uh, going across uh, the different uh, borders, uh, including with regards to you know, disciplinary or sectoral uh, borders of, of science. So, um, just uh, to give you maybe just a little bit of a, uh, of, a, of a kind of background into why UNESCO got into um, open science is that, of course, we've been seeing uh, across the world this movement uh, that calls for opening uh, science and scientific knowledge and the scientific process and practice uh, uh, more, not only among scientists, that there is need for uh, opening science for the sake of scientists, but also uh, for the society and to have um, scientists work more closely with citizens, uh, with uh, other knowledge holders uh, to be able to um, uh, advance in the scientific process and also uh, be more relevant uh, for society in certain instances. So we do understand that the question is no longer if open science is happening, it is how it's going to happen and how do we make sure that it can contribute and benefit uh, to everybody and that there is no risk of actually this transition to open science basically um, 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 having uh, 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 causing uh, even more discrepancies between the South and the North in terms of science, technology and uh, innovation. So as I said, for us, um, we see open science uh, as, as, a, as a tool that allows, or as a, as a movement, let's say, that allows scientific information, data and output to be more accessible and uh, uh, more reliably harnessed with the active engagement of all the stakeholders. So as we said, you know, it's uh, science for scientists, but it's also science for and with society. And from the UNESCO perspective, one of the critical reasons why we got into um, uh, uh, the work on open science is that from different parts of the world, particularly from the South, 
uh, open science can really be a true game changer in bridging the science, technology and innovation gap between and within countries and also fulfilling the human right to science. So this is kind of maybe where UNESCO is really coming into, the, into play uh, to ensure that open science really does bridge the gap between uh, science, technology, innovation between countries and that it fulfills the human right to science. And we also see it, you know, in the UN context and in the global context, uh, you are certainly aware of the um, United Nations um, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, and we do see open science as uh, a, a very important accelerator towards the achievement of the SDGs. Um, one of the things that our member states were really clear on, clear on is that they want the, the, this, this process of, of developing the recommendation uh, to be as inclusive, transparent and consultative as possible. And from the beginning of our discussions uh, on open science, there was a clear understanding that there's a lot of actors involved and that we have to involve all these actors into our conversations. Um, the recommendation is expected to define shared values and principles for open science, point to some concrete actions uh, for open science, and uh, also um, these actions are mainly addressed to um, the governments, but they're also addressed to these different actors of open science. It's a two-year consultation process, and I'll tell you a little bit more about how it's, it's going. It is guided by a multi-stakeholder open science advisory committee, but it has this overarching open science partnership. Um, and we are happy uh, to have citizen science partnership also as part of our partnership. And we really are hoping that, you know, it's, it's not just because we need to develop the recommendation that we want to put the different actors together. It's also because once the, uh, the recommendation is uh, adopted, somebody has to put it in place, somebody has to implement it. So as Libby was saying about the community of practice for citizen science and open science, it's open science globally as well. And again, we are very happy uh, to, to be with you today and that you are with us in, in this process. And as I said, not only while we develop the recommendation, but we really will count on this community of practice uh, that you, will be, you are building in terms of implementing the recommendation when it hopefully is uh, adopted by our member states. For the citizen science community, this invitation from UNESCO is, is an important opportunity as it's the first time we've been invited to be collaborators in defining a big global policy instrument. So how did we respond? Rather than suggesting a single representative, and because we had the experience of working within the We Observe approach in other COPs, it was easy to decide that this was a great model for the challenge we'd been given. Here is Uta Wen, who is not only one of the co-chairs of the Citizen Science and Open Science COP, but also a chair and one of the leaders of the We Observe initiative, to give us some background on its processes and progress to date. Thank you, Uta. Hello, my name is Uta Wien from IG Delft in the Netherlands, and it's my pleasure to share with you today the We Observe approach to communities of practice in the field of citizen science. Uh, I would like to share with you a little bit of background of how the We Observe project came about and why it was funded, um, how we've set up and co-designed communities of practice and what we've learned in the process so far. The We Observe project came about um, by a realization of the European Commission that its funding so far for citizen science projects, but also citizen observatories, really needed to be accompanied uh, by greater collaboration amongst such projects. So the projects you see on the screen, the SEND, GROW, Ground Truth 2.0 and then Sense projects are what we call sister projects funded under the same core. And the We Observe project um, came in in order to address challenges that the larger field um, still suffered from, from a lack of collaboration across these projects. Uh, and we see this in the broader citizen science field, where there's a lack of awareness what citizen science can really deliver in terms of data interactions uh, and change in behavior, in terms of acceptability of the, particularly the data that uh, citizen science can deliver, but also in terms of the sustainability of such projects, typically funded on a uh, project basis and once the funding run out, runs out, often these initiatives end. 
And so the realization was that really greater collaboration across projects needed to happen to strengthen the overall ecosystem of citizen science and citizen observatory projects. Citizen observatory is a term we use a lot in Europe when we refer to a particular form of citizen science that tries to establish very close links, and especially with the policy making and the uptake of citizen science results. Communities of practice were therefore one way to say we need to overcome dispersion of knowledge on citizen science practice. We need to get projects and their practitioners to work better together. And communities practice, of course, are a more generic uh, tool of knowledge management that brings together people who share a passion or a concern about a topic and they want jointly to learn how to address this better by regularly interacting face to face or online. So in We Observe, we have set up uh, four communities of practice in uh, order to address the generic challenges that we're trying to uh, tackle within the field of citizen science, namely lack of awareness, acceptability and sustainability. And you can see that the four different COPs cut across these thematic areas in different ways. So what we have seen and learned um, from, these, from this process of setting up and running the communities of practice uh, is that for, for one thing, co-design doesn't stop with agreeing objectives and uh, arriving at an inception report. It's really a way of working throughout, accommodating people and their ideas throughout the entire process. And this comes down to creating an atmosphere where everybody feels comfortable with their contribution and also the time that they can allocate for this, which of course differs very much from one person to another given the various obligations that they have. Um, people are also able to share what they do in their projects, what they've learned. They, we've created a, an atmosphere of trust where people can share not only successes but also failures and everybody can learn from them. Um, and particularly the Interrupt COP is also very good at actually experimenting with citizen science, citizen science data. And on a continuous basis, we aim for inclusiveness and equity in the ways in which we're working and making sure that we leave no one behind. We have um, produced joint outputs. Uh, for one thing, we've created uh, a joint glossary uh, as a sort of agreement of terminology. We, we found in the early ways of working, there was a lot of misunderstandings and clarifications necessary. So we've, we've codified uh, our meanings of different terms, stakeholder, co-design, engagement, etc. Um, this is available online on the We Observe website. And we're also uh, co-authoring papers and reports, and you can see some of the examples um, below. So in conclusion, um, I'm happy to share with you that the We Observe communities of practice by now are actually quite well established um, in the scientific community. To some extent, we've become a reference point for thematic discussions. And we see also that there's added value for our um, members of the community that are practice to participate, not only in terms of knowledge consolidation, um, putting, putting experiences on paper, but also the networking across the citizen science community and better linking people and projects and their activities. And finally, we're happy to see that we have also created a spin-off initiative, a sister initiative, the new citizen science and open science community of practice under the Citizen Science Global Partnership, which is based on the way in which we have set up the We Observe communities of practice. So thanks to Uta for this short summary of the background and progress of the We Observe initiative funded by the EU. Although it's only two years in existence, this initiative has, has achieved significant results and gained real respect and stature in the policy landscape of the European Union and globally. So, of course, our experience of, of establishing the Citizen Science and Open Science COP was nothing like the model, as always. It was a bit like harnessing an express train, as UNESCO gave us the invitation to be part of their process and then asked us to prepare a short background paper all within three weeks. Fortunately, when we put the call out, the global interest and response was so good that we were able to produce a creditable document that they say is very useful to them. As you can see, the views of 63 citizen science practitioners from 24 countries were synthesized to, to create this background paper. And we, we talked about all, all the issues and elements that, that UNESCO were interested in looking at. 
That call for interest has given us an amazing global network of passionate practitioners and already many insightful perspectives, ideas and references. Since July, we've got on track and had our first COP workshop, um, which was taken over two days um, because of different time zones. And the information and ideas from that were the basis for our inception report, which will be the framework for our future work. Stephanie would like me to mention Miro, which is a remote working platform which we used for the first time. It's fantastic because using a virtual whiteboard, even with big groups of, say, 80 contributors, everyone can add their ideas and work together, so everyone's engaged. Also, the comments can be downloaded as a spreadsheet. It's a great tool. Because one of the basic requirements in nurturing a productive and enjoyable community of practice is the opportunity for everyone to both contribute and interact. And Miro certainly helps with that. The COP also contributed a session to the recent EXA conference. And some of the diverse contributions from our members have really enforced, reinforced our understanding that the power inherent in community of practice work comes from encouraging knowledge and sharing from all sources and being open to the amazing experiences of our fellow citizen science practitioners worldwide. By creating a culture of diversity, equity and inclusiveness, we all learn so much. Some members of the COP have an academic focus. Others are interested in things like licensing and data accessibility. Personally, it's on the on-the-ground action work that fascinates me, and I want to share just a couple of examples from our EXA presentation that I would never have known about without the COP work. This is from Mariana Varese, who's been working for over 20 years with over 100 groups of citizen science researchers in the Amazon basin, researching fish migrations and water quality, and referencing sophisticated and advanced thinking on situated openness to help advance her work. Dealing with some of the most intractable issues like power imbalances inherent in funded research and privacy issues and around some sorts of important data. Shannon Dosaminga sharing the principles that guide the work of the global open science hardware movement, which again resonate with all of us working in citizen science. Just look at these principles that they're working with. And these are evidenced all the time in their, the actions and the work that they do. By just sharing these practical examples and realizing that this work is actually going on and being successful across the world and learning and thinking about more about the different challenges being experienced by colleagues is what these communities of practice are all about. Are all about. So this is how we make connections, partnerships and co-creation work at local and global levels. It's all about sharing a passion or concern and learning how to improve things through reg regular interactions. And these are, are advanced and sophisticated and networked approach based on shared values. And the methodologies, management and actions flow from these principles from these principles. So thank you very much, everybody, for listening. And um, we'd like to invite anyone who's interested to join our community of practice. You'll find details on the Citizen Science Global Partnership website and lots of other background information. And you can talk to me. And Uta would also like to invite everyone to look and become involved with their communities of practice, which are not just European-based. And uh, she's offering, as we all are, to help uh, with anyone in Australia who would be interested in exploring how to develop good communities.